Dini Rajkumar, strategic communication and crisis coach to C-suite executives, host of Real Talk with Rashini on WCCO Radio in Minnesota and the Real Leaders with Rashini podcast. She's a licensed attorney herself and a former TV reporter. Check out her book, Communicate That, now in its third edition. Her website, ownyourwow.com. We have a lot to talk about with regards to Amy Coney Barrett, so it's good to have you back. Well, thanks so much. And, you know, anytime there's anything involved with the Supreme Court of the United States, it really brings me back to my law school days and always my love of the Constitution. And I really love it, and I know you do too, when the Constitution is front and center on American television because it gives a lot of people the civics lessons that they don't really have or they forgot about. That is exactly right. It brings us more focused on what this country is about. I want to play a clip. This is one of the examples where Amy Coney Barrett, judge on the Seventh Circuit, President Trump's nominee to the United States Supreme Court, said something that well, I could resemble given that my mother's name is Amy. Here's a sample of Amy Coney Barrett expressing her judicial philosophy. Tell me why textualism and originalism are important to you because I think that both statutes and the Constitution are law. Um, they derive their democratic legitimacy from the fact that they have been enacted in the case of statutes by the people's representatives or in the case of the Constitution through the Constitution making process. And I, as a judge, have an obligation to respect and enforce only that law that the people themselves have embraced. As I was saying earlier, it's not the law of Amy, it's the law of the American people. And I think originalism and textualism, to me, boil down to that, to a commitment to the rule of law, to not disturbing or changing or updating or, you know, adjusting in, cons in line with my own policy preferences what that law requires. Well, there was another part earlier where she talked about how she doesn't even think her kids would... <laughs> her kids like living under the the court of Amy. But what do you make of that sort of philosophy? And I could relate with my mother being Amy. So what do you make of that? Well, I mean, she's, I would agree with what she's saying as far as the role of a judge, especially is to really respect what the rule of law is. And the rule of law in this country is really the American people, you know, all people that we elect into office who then in turn are part of the process to bring Supreme Court justices to be, everybody should be following the law. And those laws are really the will of the people. And over the centuries, over the decades, different generations have been involved in enacting those laws. And occasionally we have laws that are wiped out. We have court cases that, you know, that uh, reverse previous court cases or that break precedent, but that is never really the role of the judge to do or the Supreme Court or courts in general to do. Those are actions for the, the will of the people that happens through the Congress of the United States, which involves the House and the Senate. So what I really heard from that answer and a lot of other of her responses over the course of her hearings, Jimmy, is that she does respect the rule of law. And that's really what we need to focus on. That's the politicking that both parties are trying to bring around this process. Well, there was one exchange that I found pretty striking with your own senator in Minnesota, Amy Klobuchar, over John Roberts and her past writings that Judge Barrett had put forward regarding the Affordable Care Act. Senator Klobuchar, I just want to clarify, is this the constitutional commentary publication that you and I discussed? Yes, it I is. That? Yeah, okay. that it is, but it's still a Minnesota, no, it, University of Minnesota. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to be sure because yep. I hadn't mm -hmm. published in the Minnesota I just, Law Review. Again, did you ask that question? Did you say that, that he pushed the Affordable Care Act beyond its plausible meaning to save the statute? Um, one thing I want to clarify is you said that I criticized, you know, Chief Justice Roberts and... I don't attack people, just ideas. So okay. that was just designed to to make a comment about his reasoning in that case, which, I've, as I've said before, is consistent with the way the majority opinion characterized it as the less plausible reading of the statute. I love that answer because she was very poised, very clear, very calm. And she just said right out there, Rashini Rajkumar, I don't attack people, just ideas. That is a great line in that overall response and 
Boy, do I wish we all could remember that right now, because what is happening is people are attacking people. Americans are attacking Americans. Instead of just saying, this idea may be flawed, or how you're looking at it could use a different approach. And so for her to say that in such an articulate manner and was very much challenged by a popular United States senator, I think she's saying, look, popularity is not what I'm about. I'm about the rule of law. I'm about ideas. And if even the Chief Justice of the United States of America has what I believe is an erroneous interpretation of a law, I'm going to point that out, but I'm not attacking him in doing so. Right. And there was another instance, and I think this was with Senator Chris Coons of Connecticut, where she stood up for her own independence as a judge, but also as a human being. To be clear, as I said, I think in response to this question yesterday, I do share Justice Scalia's approach to text, originalism and textualism. But in the litany of cases that you've just identified, the particular votes that he's, he cast are a different question of whether I would agree with the way that he applied those principles in particular cases. And I've already said, you know, and, and I hope that you aren't suggesting that I don't have my own mind or that I, I couldn't think independently or that I would just decide like, oh, let me see what Justice Scalia has said about this in the past, because I assure you I have my own mind. Um, but. It, Everything that he said um, is not necessarily what I would agree with or what I would do if I were Justice Barrett. That was Justice Scalia. So I share his philosophy, but I've never said that I would always reach the same outcome as he did. Understood. Yeah, and that was Chris Coons, but from Delaware, not from Connecticut. And I just, I thought that was also a strong way to respond to basically say, look, I have my own mind. I hope you're not suggesting otherwise. Yeah, Senator Coons was pretty tough on her. I remember hearing some of that exchange. And the thing about this, which I will say as someone who's nonpartisan, but as a strategic communicator and a communication and crisis coach, it is very difficult to find fault with how Judge Barrett answered these questions. She was very direct. She was very sure of herself. She was very on point when it comes to her very detailed knowledge of the law. I mean, think about the pressure she is under for these hearings. And she got herself ready. She prepared well. She's been a judge for a few years. She was a law professor prior to that. So she knows these laws. And she really took the nature of these hearings seriously, Jimmy. And unfortunately, the Kavanaugh hearings were just sort of a nightmare for the country. But I'm really glad that Judge Barrett is part of a hearings process where we are just hearing about her. We are getting questions from both sides of the aisle that she is standing up to quite well, responding very thoroughly. It does not, at least that I heard, now I didn't hear every hour of testimony or of uh, debate and exchange, but it wasn't some major personal attack. It, you don't have a lot of credibility if you attack the person who Judge Barrett is. She seems like she is an ethical person, a really great mother, and an outstanding lawyer and jurist. And I do not say that lightly. Though I don't practice law, I'm a licensed attorney. I've studied a lot of these cases that she's talking about. I've watched judges and attorneys in trial and in appellate hearings, and you know the ones that have their you-know-what together. Mm -hmm. She had her stuff together, and she was not ready to back down to anybody. And I think there were a couple lighter moments in there where we got some laughs, too, which is always nice to see during hearings. Like yes, that. and I got one or two of those points I want to share in just a moment here with you, Rashini Rajkumar, our guest host of Real Talk with Rashini on WCCO Radio in Minnesota and communications coach extraordinaire. All right. So on this topic of the personal attacks, one thing that I I mean, let's talk about this from the visual standpoint, from the presentation standpoint. Um, Amy Coney Barrett, unlike Brett Kavanaugh, for example, is a woman and she's a very mild mannered woman. She's very thoughtful. She's very uh, measured in her language. 
I think that if the Democrats were really going to try to tear into her very harshly, that it would not play well. And indeed, I think that she has come across to average Americans extraordinarily well with the way that she has conducted herself in these proceedings. And so I I think that that's part of the reason why we didn't see. We saw some biting criticism, some very strong back and forths between Judge Barrett and the Democrats and the committee. But I think it was a little more tempered than we might have gotten, say, if President Trump had appointed a man. What do you think? Right. I, you know, I'm big on not calling someone a woman leader or right. identifying the gender. But Judge Barrett has really made judges proud, has made the law and the Constitution proud. And if you are a, just a fair minded woman, I think you can also say she has made women proud. I mean, not many women have been in that seat in the history of our country. And she is holding herself up so well. She held herself up well, responded to questions respectfully. She, I mean, I really give her a 10. And I mean, you've asked me to review a lot of people over the six plus years, and I don't give many people a 10, Jimmy. Let's get personal here in terms of one of the questions that she was asked by Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana. She was asked to respond to some of the hateful personal attacks against her because she has two adopted children from Haiti. I'm, I'm going to finish this housekeeping because I want to talk about the law. I want to give you a chance to respond to something. Some butthead professor at Boston University says that because you and your husband have two children of color, that you're a white colonist. The implication is that you're a racist and that you use your two children as props. Do you use your children as props? Senator Kenny, it was the risk of people saying things like that, which would be so hurtful to my family, that when I told Senator Graham this morning that my husband and I had to really weigh the costs of this, it was saying deeply offensive and hurtful things, things that are not only hurtful to me, but are hurtful to my children, who are my children, who we love, and who we brought brought home and made part of our family. And accusations like that are cruel. Yeah, they are, aren't they? How low can you go? I didn't want to ask that question when your kids were here. I'm sorry I have to go through that. I think any feeling human being, and especially any mother watching, can truly relate to that. And that's why I think that it was one of the most powerful moments of all four days of Amy Coney Barrett testimony. Yeah, truly powerful. And it really was a low blow. I can't even imagine what has to be in your mind to say something like that. And the other thing is she already had had several children by the time she made those adoptions. I, I think anyone who has kids on any level or is part of a child's life, it's a lot to raise one child, let alone five, six, seven, or nine, you know, mm-hmm. whatever the number is. That is just, it, it's almost a comment that doesn't, really deserve any kind of attention, but I know they had to handle it in hearings like that. And I mean, I think a lot of people would fall apart in Mm -hmm. answering that Mm -hmm. um, in such a public forum. And she did a really good job in keeping her cool and keeping her humanity. I'm sure Mm -hmm. it didn't matter what your politics were. You were on Judge Barrett's side during that response. No doubt. And the mere fact that and I, that individual, that professor, wasn't the only person to say things like that, particularly on social media, but also on other platforms. And it's just shocking when you think about it. However, there was there were lighter moments. I think you alluded to one of these and it was uh, it was one that did immediately. It, it became a meme online and it was the notepad part. Here's Senator John Cornyn posing questions to Judge Barrett. You know, most of us have multiple notebooks and notes and books and things like that in front of us. Can you hold up what you've been referring to and answering our questions? Is there anything on it? Uh, that letterhead that says United States Senate. That's, imp- that's impressive. <laughs> it truly really was impressive. Extraordinary that she was working off of no notes throughout these days. I mean, I don't know if later on she eventually put a few notes down, but she actually showed a blank notepad. And that 
truly shows that she's on her game. I loved that. And, you know, I'm big on trying to get my clients off notes just for a 45 or 60 minute keynote. Yes. I'm here for days of hearings. She was able to do that. She is my new poster child <laughs> for you really don't need notes. <laughs> That's exactly right. If you know what you're talking about and you can work off of your memory and your understanding and level of comprehension and you demonstrate that even literally by showing that you don't have any notes written down, I think that speaks to the caliber of an individual seeking a position where you really do need to consider a variety of different factors on the fly, in addition to in your books and, you know, in the research that you have to conduct. Right. I mean, it is almost impossible for the days long hearings and even one full day of hearings to not really have notes. But it's true. If you authentically and thoroughly know your subject matter and you are asked a question, you can handle it. And what happens is people's own inner narrative gets in the way. They think they need to use a special language or do it in some flowery flowery way instead of just authentically responding. And then on that same note, if you truly don't have the answer, then you can authentically say, you know what, I either don't know or I would need to look into that or I need to refer to the record, which I don't have in front of me. So then you can also put yourself in a position to answer honestly and transparently when you truly don't know and you won't look bad. Mm -hmm. That is one of the things that is so beautiful about not using notes and really growing your inner narrative. And when I've been on your shows, Jimmy, talking about how can regular people learn from current events or what we watch and see, this is a huge lesson. Mm -hmm. So I give your listeners a challenge to try to do the next meeting without notes and just rely on how comfortable you are and how much you know your information and chances right. are you're going to have a big win. I feel most comfortable when I am working off of no or very few notes. If I have to memorize something, then I have problems because I am terrible at memorization. But also like when I go in and do an interview like this for Shini Rajkumar, I just ask, okay, what are some top points that we should get into? Or I have in my mind, these are the points. And then I'm coming up with the questions as we're having our conversation as opposed to, you know, jotting down all sorts of questions because I want to see where the conversation will go. And I think that's part of the mindset probably of Judge Barrett. I want to get to the politics of this a little bit. Um, Senator Dianne Feinstein was even pretty complimentary of not only Judge Barrett, but also the proceedings of the hearings, literally saying this is one of the best hearings I've ever been in. Okay, I might be paraphrasing a little bit there, but she said that she even was complimentary of an explanation on severability that Judge Barrett gave. And then afterwards, or after one of the days of hearings, CNN's Dana Bash and John King both praised Judge Barrett, and I want to play that snippet. Well, the other thing that I will just note, uh, which I think is going to be an instant meme, John, is the fact that she had no notes. Then uh, she was asked by, I think it was Senator John Cornyn, to hold up the notepad in front of her, and it was blank except oh. for the uh, for the United States Senate um, kind of uh, stationery that was on it, and that's it. Uh, I think that is going to be very impressive to Republicans and Democrats. Not that everybody didn't think she was smart, but because she was that confident in how she was going to express herself. Right. And let, let's be honest. If Number one, if we could roll back the clock and we were not so close to an election. Number two, if we could roll back even further and this were another Republican president in another age, I've been in Washington long enough, Judge Amy Coney Barrett would be getting 70 votes or more in the United no States question. Senate because of her qualifications. Andrea Mitchell over on MSNBC also gave praise. So as we wrap up with you, Rashini Rajkumar, how do you view the politics of all this, especially in light of how effectively Judge Amy Coney Barrett conducted herself throughout the hearing? A lot of people are saying this is going to go along party lines, and that should just in a, in a very slim way, majority give her the, the yes vote. But what I would like to see is Democrats really look inside of themselves and ask themselves, what side of history do I want to be on? You know, here's this amazing jurist who understands and loves the law, loves the Constitution. Can they go outside of politics? It's really the Democrats right now we need to ask that question of, can you go outside of politics and vote for this woman? She did nothing wrong during her hearings. I mean, it was, if I could have scripted hearings, that's what I would have scripted, Jimmy. 
And so that is what anyone who's represented by a Democrat in the Senate right now needs to be asking of their senator. You got to vote for Judge Barrett. It's not about politics because the court is supposed to be the most stable branch of our government. And we want people, regardless of who appoints them or even votes them in, we want these judges to be neutral on the law, respectful of the law, because when they do that, they're respectful of the American people. So my, I, she has my vote if I could vote for her. And I really do hope she gets confirmed next week. And 30 seconds, final question, Rashini Rajkumar, how do you think this plays out with the election? You know, I don't know what kind of effect it will have. I think there's so many other things that are overriding. I think we need to get through this and then other issues that are out there or have been tabled will probably affect the election more. However, don't let that fool you. The parties may still politic with this. Yeah, well, and I certainly think that for a lot of conservatives, it revs us up and gets us ready to go. It's the number one reason why I voted for President Trump in 2016 and is very much delivered. Rashini Rajkumar, host of Real Talk with Rashini on WCCO Radio and the Real Leaders with Rashini podcast. Check out our book, Communicate That, and website, ownyourwow.com. Always great to check in with you, my friend. Thanks so much for your insights as an attorney and someone who really understands communication strategies. Thanks so much, Jimmy.